Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, a podcast where we explore the many ways that weather intertwines itself into our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and this week we're going to be talking about weather delays. Our favorite thing whenever we're trying to go somewhere and relax, isn't it? Or we got to really get somewhere. And we're at an airport. Those delay signs start, delays and cancels for that matter, start popping up. But before we jump into the topic, there are a couple things this week weather-wise that kind of caught my attention, a little different. Like many of you probably, I've been looking at where can I get away safely, maybe do a little vacation. So I've been looking outdoorsy kind of places, just you know, like I've mentioned before, just like I've been doing with bike rides and hikes around where I'm at. But I've been looking distances a little further. So, of course, I looked at the National Park Service this week, popped up their website, you know, as they've started opening the parks again around where I am and, and nationally. And challenges, I think a lot of people will be heading there, but it, it's a it's a natural choice for me. You know, somewhere outdoor, somewhere I can spend some time, you know, naturally social distanced. If I can find accommodations, which is one of the tricky parts. But, you know, I've been looking kind of far. Maybe places people wouldn't go. But Glacier National Park's northern end of the U.S. Never been there. You would think that that's the kind of place I've been to, but I've never been there. But what I came across was their snow plowing report, June, right? Here we are, day before summer officially. Official first day of summer tomorrow. Yet they were talking about snow plowing. And I was amazed to see, I'll put a link in the show notes about the Photos that they post for their snow plowing efforts this year. But here we are, June, and they're still removing huge amounts of snows from one of the well known roads in Glacier that you know you get around on. But apparently this is a big thing for them every year. And the equipment they use and the process they go through, it it was incredible. Seeing that much snow still being moved this time of year. And the effort to do it and how involved that effort is. And I was reminded of, you know, another national park made a trip to Yellowstone out in the early 90s. Haven't been there. I need to get back to Yellowstone, I think. And the week I was there, right around the beginning of June, the week before had been beautiful. You know, temperatures, mid-70s for the you felt Celsius, Fahrenheit fans, for you Celsius fans, 25-ish, right? Didn't think too much about it. Back in that day and age, it wasn't as easy to get those kind of internet-based real-time weather reports. So it kind of planned around that, what the weather was like. Got out there. I think it was 8 to 10 inches of snow we got while we were there. Spent a lot of time buying sweatshirts at the gift shop to outfit for a few days really cold. Then, of course, the week after that, when I, I was at a conference out in, in Montana, Bozeman, Montana, and a coworker who was also covering the same conference, we, we split it up. So I, I did the week before I came out and did a vacation, and they were staying afterwards and doing it. They did whitewater rafting, and they had great temperatures again. So I, I didn't mind. You know me. I like the snow. So I was okay with it. So it does happen. Even in June, you can have snow clearing. The other thing that caught my attention actually happened this morning. So there's a meteorologist. It's on TV in Huntsville, Alabama area. WHNT, I think, is the station. Hopefully I got that right. Christina Edwards, somebody I went to school with at Georgia Tech, who was sporting her new face covering. She called it the Golden Tornado. And she was relaying something that I guess I had forgotten or didn't know. There's a book that's called Clean Old Fashioned Hate, and it's about the rivalry between Georgia Tech and the University of Georgia. And in there, it references the fact that the Yellow Jackets, which is what Georgia Tech's mascot is today, it wasn't always the case. So back (laughs) during the pandemic years of around 1918, they were actually known as the Golden Tornado. So that little tidbit of information 
was shared with me this morning. Thank you, Christina. And I'll put a link into her little Instagram post where she puts that on there. Well, snappy little face covering she has. Very good of her to give it in a, a very formal sounding name. All right, let's talk about it. So this show idea came to me back in January. And it's actually not new. You know, probably the biggest question I get from people. Why was my flight delayed? Why was my flight canceled? Sometimes I'm actually able to dig into it, and I can find it interesting. Maybe I was surprised to hear from them. Most of the time I can give the standard answer, which is probably you know X or Y. I, mean, I can do it in 10, 15 seconds of, of looking at things. But, you know, every now and then I see an unusual storm event that I was unaware of or an unusual situation that can lead to different flight delays. But as I'm hearing more family and friends getting back on planes and seeing more evidence, I'm, I'm near quite a few airports here, but particularly I'm in the flight path near Newark Airport here in New Jersey, New York City area. And I'm seeing more planes, hearing more planes. So I know more people are getting back in the air. But we're also that time of year where we do get lots of weather delays. Yeah, we get them sometimes in winter with, with winter storms, no doubt. But this time of year, it can be really frustrating because you are maybe trying to go on vacation, trying to get somewhere. And maybe you finally made the decision to get back on a plane after all that trouble and you get to the airport and you end up getting delayed. It's, it's bound to be even more frustrating now. So why does that happen, right? What are the causes? And not only what are the causes for the delays themselves, but what's the difference between what might terrify you weather-wise about flying versus what the pilots may actually be worried about. And let's put in context, I'm talking about it from a, a airliner standpoint, right? I'm not talking about small planes. They've got their own challenges, many of which are the same, of course. But they have challenges that aren't necessarily, and we'll hit on some of them, why it might be a little different for a jet, you know, 100 plus carrying capacity jet versus a, a small prop engine plane. Now, some of the challenges are, are kind of obvious because they're very visually reinforcing. And a couple that come to mind are fog and like a winter storm, but particularly with ice. And the reason they are is because they cause challenges for you getting to the airport. It can be hard to see. Conditions may be slippery or slick. And so we're, we experience those, and so it doesn't surprise us necessarily. We're not happy about it, but when we get to the airport, we see these sort of delays. And let's keep in mind that when we have a delay in one place, it can stack. It's just like rush hour, right? You get a, a wreck somewhere, or you get a delay somewhere, and because of the amount of planes moving from major airports, it can cause a cascading effect, right? So other flights get delayed, even though you may not be in that area. So Literally, there could be a flight that's delayed in San Francisco because of fog that messes you up in, you know, Miami because it was the flight that was coming to you and that might have nothing to do with point A to point B where you're going. But it's the origin of, of your flight that's the trigger mechanism for why you end up getting delayed. But interesting, fog and ice are, are tend to be more of a ground-based problem because these bigger planes now can use a, a lot of automated technology to get the plane from being in the air to being on the ground. And while fog, fog is very difficult visually at lower elevations, and particularly once a plane's on the ground, and making sure it's clear and other planes can move without running into each other on the runway or on the taxiways or around the gates. But coming in for a landing, fog, it doesn't present some of the challenges we might see with other types of weather. Because realistically, for you to have fog, the air actually has to be pretty still. So I, it can be a visual block, if you will. The airplane has tools to be able to see, so it can get from the air to the ground. So you might think about, let's go back to the ice. Ice actually tends to also be a bigger problem on the ground. Now, it's not to say ice can't be a problem in the air, but in this day and age, the airplanes are built to handle ice in the air. And they've got a few different systems to do that. However, when you first get going, ice does build up while it's on the ground. As the 
because the airplane's cold and it's just sitting there. But once its systems get going, it can run the heat, the a mass amount of heat it produces through those wings. There, there's a variety of things it can do to keep ice from forming or to remove ice if it does start to form. But on the ground, it's cold, it's miserable. You And anybody who's flown a fair amount, particularly in the wintertime, has probably been de-iced at some point. And that process, because it's not like they can do a, every plane at once, tends to slow things down. I remember a time, even when I was flying out of Syracuse, an area that's used to winter weather, of course. But I had to be de-iced twice because the plane went, got de-iced and the storm got worse, so they weren't flying and taking off as quickly. And then stuff started the freeze on the plane again. I had to be de-iced a second time. But generally in the air, even though it's interesting scientifically how ice can actually form on a wing, because you might think to yourself, because it's not snow that's sticking. It's, it's actually water that's freezing on the plane. And you're wondering, how, how does that necessarily happen? Well, water can not freeze and be below freezing. And that's where the challenge can present itself, because then it does come in contact with this cold metal surface and it can freeze. But again, generally in this day and age, it's a problem on the ground or before you take off or after you land or if you're at the gate, right? How about rain? Generally, rain's not a problem, but, you know, we start getting into specific type of rain. So let's talk about thunderstorms, right? It's this time. It's that's the thing this time of year. And thunderstorms can present a variety of things that can be challenging to fly around and in and through. Lightning, you might think. No, not really. Again, planes are kind of designed to handle that lightning problem. How about hail? Oh, now, you know, now you're talking. It, it, it can do damage to a plane. And there's been some interesting photos I've even seen in the last 10 years of, you know, that nose cone on the plane. For the most part, that's it's it's not a big structural thing it's more about aerodynamics and sometimes there's systems in that like it can actually hold radar systems and stuff that's beneficial to an aircraft or windshields can get cracked and i've seen some pretty incredible things but for the most part hail is fairly uncommon all right to begin with but you can sort of eyeball the storms that might that might cause hail and generally avoid those not to say that planes don't get caught up in them but generally, it's not that big of an issue. Can be. Not likely to bring the plane down, although it might cause a pilot to revert and do an emergency landing. Again, seen stories of that. So it's something to be cautious of. Now you're thinking, okay, how about the winds? Something in the winds and thunderstorms, yeah. Uh, that's generally where we get into things. And it's not just the winds itself. And and people, when people think about winds when they're flying, the number one fear people have is about turbulence in general. And that doesn't even have to be with a thunderstorm, right? We've all experienced turbulence. And I, I remember some of the worst turbulence I've had have been in clear air situations. And it's been thermally driven. And that's what most of us experience, particularly if you fly over mountains. You've got these uneven surface level conditions that trigger different, as the air's heated and it's moving upward, trigger different behavior, different flows and, you know, rates of of wind moving at different things. And we just call them eddies in, in the grand scheme of fluid dynamics. Now, you may ask, is there a, an easy way to visually kind of imagine that? And the best way I know to tell anybody is looking at a river or a creek, and particularly where you have an area, maybe you have an outcropping of some, you know, the bank of a river or just some stones that are in the river that create a little protected pool area, right? And you have the, the more general flow. But you may notice at the border between where that still water is and the more general flowing water that you get these little currents that look different. Well, that's an eddy. And that's generally what turbulence is. And so it can happen at different little boundary areas, or it can happen where things are kind of mixed up a little bit. Things are uneven, right? But for the most part, they're very temporary and they're very small. 
And when they're happening at 30,000 feet or 20,000 feet or 10,000 feet, it's not really a problem for the aircraft. You're not liking it. It can make you sick. I can remember flights that made me absolutely miserable, even on a very short flight. One that went over the Andes Mountains between Argentina and Chile. Actually, it was between Chile and Argentina, technically. But I remember everybody getting off that plane and staying in the line at, at, at Customs and Immigration and everybody just being green. It was miserable, right? It was an absolutely miserable situation. But was my life ever in danger? No, not really. Pilots would prefer to not have to deal with an unhappy set of people on the plane. But they also know that, generally speaking, that run-of-the-mill turbulence and even heavy turbulence, which can, if you're not ready for it, if you don't have your seatbelt on when you should, can cause injuries. And it's also why I generally keep my seatbelt on, even when I don't have to, because I know those things can happen. And I, I recommend that to you, too. It's just a good precaution, right? But let's get back to this combination of things. And, and a thunderstorm is a classic example of one where you can imagine it, but probably the most dangerous situation is a near ground scenario where we have wind shear. All right. Now, what is wind shear? Think of wind shear as being a gradient. All right. It's a change between wind behavior it could either be in an, uh, you know, thinking about it in a horizontal plane or it can be thinking about it vertically where we have a change, where wind is coming along in a certain way and all of a sudden it changes very drastically. And thunderstorms can cause that. And actually our understanding of this probably the most dangerous scenario for airplanes came about because a thunderstorm-induced downdraft that brought down an airplane, JFK Airport, 1975, Eastern Airlines. Do you know Eastern Airlines? I know Eastern Airlines. It's because the first airline I ever flew. But <laughs> oh, I feel bad. Eastern Airlines was rebooting this year. January was their new flight. I'm not sure that they've survived everything that's gone on. But Eastern Airlines, big airlines, so they investigated what brought their plane down. And it was investigated by a meteorologist by the name of Ted Fujita. Now, you may have heard that name before if you have heard anything about tornadoes or if you live in a tornado area, you would have heard of the Fujita scale or the enhanced Fujita scale. So he's well known for his work in tornadoes. And as a sideline, there's a, been a recent thing on PBS. If any of you have it, you might want to look up Ted Fujita. It's F-U-J-I-T-A and PBS. You can Google it and see if it's on in your local PBS station. I haven't caught it, but I'm hoping to catch that. And while he's well known for his tornado work, it's actually his work that he did in investigating that plane crash and discovering what is our understanding now of these downbursts or microbursts as well that come out of thunderstorms that went a long way towards advancing our ability to avoid, for pilots to not be caught up in bad wind shear scenarios, but you've probably heard it over the last 20 or 30 years about wind shear detection systems and those sort of things. But it doesn't always happen with bad thunderstorms, right? Just like turbulence doesn't. So really it's this invisible threat that's probably the biggest risk. Now, the small version of the invisible risk, the turbulence, that may shatter our nerves, but it's the big version, these wind shear or downburst or microburst events that are probably the biggest risk to an airplane because we're back to this combination of things. Planes near the ground. Planes are at their best when they're doing their thing at mostly full speed, right? They, they're at full power. They've got the capacity to do things. And they can handle little jostles in their system. But when they're close to the ground, when they're coming in for a landing, or they're making that transition from being a machine of flight, which is what they're designed for, to a machine on the ground, which is really not what they're designed for. It's when they're most vulnerable. It's less room for error, if you will. So when we have these wind shear events, they can be particularly deadly, which they have been. But thanks to the advances, we can now largely avoid them. However, 
However, the biggest risk is they're not always visually obvious, right? So wind, this invisible weather component, is probably the biggest risk to the plane. And oddly enough, it's the one that drives you nuts in, a, in the turbulence form. Is it invisible weather phenomenon? It's not the ones we see. It's this invisible one that's, that's the both the, on the discomfort scale for us, makes us not happy in flight, but also the one that the pilots have to be most aware of. And again, thankfully, there's a lot of visual cues that these events might be happening. But thankfully, also, we have these detection systems in place that help protect those planes around the airport so that we can safely go about our business because the pilots have the tools to make sure this potentially catastrophic weather phenomenon doesn't catch them off guard. Now, you may be asking yourself, how in the world did we end up talking about this? Or what was it in January that brought to mind? And actually, it goes back even a little further. Last fall when I was making a flight, I dealt with some turbulent flight. I had one. There was a cold front running through the eastern half of the U.S. And my flight path was literally, would be almost along this frontal boundary from point A to point B. But the pilot kind of had to skirt the eastern side of the frontal boundary until it got far enough east. And then he kind of had to find a gap where he could get through the plane to get through safely. But, you know, there was, it was a very turbulent flight. Was there any real, there was lots of planes out that day. And that's the thing with all this stuff. When you think about it, think about how many flights all the time go through thunderstorms and all that safely and go through turbulence because most flights have a little bit of it at some point. So that one had it on my mind. But in January, I was at, interestingly enough, the American Meteorological Society's annual meeting. And the day I was leaving, I had to get somewhere because I was doing a trip at the end of that. I was going to be gone for that weekend. And I really needed to be back in New York City. Had a flight. It's a very short flight. But I was looking at the forecast and the way the Boston airport set up, it's set up for, and most airports are, for a certain wind flow pattern because planes are better suited to not have crosswinds taking off and landing. Again, something that could lead to a, a disastrous scenario. And this storm that had come through was changing the wind flow. It was gonna, one, is going to have very strong winds, but two, was going to be abnormal to the normal routine, and I knew it was going to cause delays. Now, thankfully... Between Boston and New York, I also have train as an option. So I took the train the next morning. Had to get up early. It was a nice ride, actually. And that flight was indeed delayed by eight plus hours. And many friends I had who were still at the conference got stuck in a weather delay. Some had flights were canceled. Some that had delayed. Most, most people got out, ultimately. But, you know, it was a bumpy flight for them. At least the first part of it is they got away from the storm. Now, you may ask, also, is there anything you can do to avoid turbulence? Well, there are some things you can do. One is always better to fly early in the morning, generally. One of the, one of the big causes of turbulence is the heating of the day. Don't fly over mountains. Easier said than done. But particularly later in the day, because turbulence will generally be worse as the heating of those uneven surfaces causes uneven behavior aloft. It's really that kind of straightforward. Fly in the mornings. Or if you like, you want to avoid fog, don't fly out of a foggy airport. And again, easier said than done. But if you have an option, think about those things. There are things you can try to do to avoid delays. It's not always that straightforward. But you can usually find an answer. All right. If you have inner inner interesting flight weather related things you want to pass my way don't hesitate to reach out what is it about the weather at gmail.com of course you can find us on twitter you can find me on twitter too mark jelinek i think it's mark underscore jelinek is what i have and if for those of you who don't know my now it's j-e-l-i-n-e-k but as you go on with your summer the start of summer may you Find some new ways to see weather and the weather impacts on 
what you do. And hopefully someone more positive. I mean, those are the ones I enjoy. You kind of look at it and go, oh, that's kind of cool. And we'll hit some of those. I also had a frustrating one this past week, and I'm not going to tell you about it now. I had one that was driving me absolutely bonkers. And we'll hit that one in a few weeks as well. Decided to put it down. Don't want to be too emotional when I'm talking about that one. But let's just say it talk, it's about technology and weather and being outdoors. But for now, may you have nice weather. May we all. But may we also have interesting weather in a way that makes us go, aha. Because as we all know, there's much more to weather than the weather itself.